I would like to welcome you to lecture four. In this lecture we are going to look at the transport vessel the xylem. This lecture is part of the subject plant physiology which is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology degree offered at North Melbourne Institute of TAFE. Please visit our website for further information on this subject and the other courses that we offer at www.nmit Dot edu dot au. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. In this lecture we are going to be discussing the transport vessels, the xylem. Before you attempt this lecture, please ensure that you have watched the other lectures in the prescribed order, starting with lecture 1 in the introduction to plant physiology, then lecture 2 on the structure and function of roots, lecture 3 on plant nutrition. Please ensure that you have done and completed all the associated readings and the Moodle quizzes, as the knowledge in these will help you with this lecture. We will start this lecture with a review or an overview of the functional roles of the xylem. We will concentrate on the movement of water. In order to understand the movement of water, you need to understand the structure. The structure of a xylem is a very special biological structure. We will look specifically at the triads and the vessel member, mem members, as well as the pit and the fibre structures, and how these work together to move water up through the plant. The role of water potential, resistance and tension is essential in the xylem water transport mechanism, and we will review this. There are issues with water moving under tension which lead to a biological phenomenon called cavitation. Once a compound is entered in through the root system, it then has to be moved around to its final location. This is called solute transport. It is defined as the movement of solutes from one location to another within the plant. Solute transport occurs in the vascular system, which comprises of two structures, the xylem and the phloem. The xylem has some very important functional rules. The xylem transports solutes throughout the plant, primary solutes such as water and nutrients. The solute transport in plants is complex and, and specialised. Understanding these mechanisms can begin to inform growers and farmers of the importance of the control of water and nutrient transport in plants. The transport of solutes is dependent on both the chemical composition of the solute and the physical processes within the plant. The most common form of transported solutes is in the ionic form. Transport of solutes can occur on two scales. There are local or short distance transport, and these tend to be regulated by membranes. And there are larger scales, uh, longer distance transport, and these are controlled by membranes. The xylem constitutes the longest part of water transport pathway in many plants. For example, in a one meter tall plant, about 99.5% of water transport is through the xylem. This percentage increases as the tree or plant grows taller. Xylem is a simple pathway with low resistance. The route of solute transport in a simple concept is from the soil matrix through the root hair, through the root cortex into the xylem, upwards into the leaves and then if the substance is water it's diffused through the stomata. The xylem structure plays a critical link in the pathway of water in plants. This image on the slide is a simple concept illustration showing the vein and the xylem and the phloem vessels which are incorporated into the vein. It is along these vessels that water and nutrients move. Let us re review briefly the journey to the xylem that we learnt in lecture 2. Solutes are absorbed from the root matrix. 
where they cross the epidermis and make their way to the centre of the root, crossing the cortex and the endodermis before arriving at the xylem. Along the way, solutes travel in cells in the aplastic pathway, or they can travel through the symplastic pathway, or they can travel through the transmembrane pathway. At the endodermis, the aplastic pathway is blocked by a gasset-like band of cerberin, a waterproof substance that seals off the root of water in the apoplast, forcing water to cross via the cell-to-cell -cell transmembrane pathway. Because water must cross the cell membrane, for example in the cortex and at the aplastic barriers, Transport efficiency of the cell-to-cell -cell pathway is affected by the activity, density and location of water-specific protein channels embedded in cell membranes. One such cell membrane is called an aquaporin. Much work has been done over the last two decades to demonstrate how aquaporins alter root hydro hydraulic resistance and respond to abiotic stresses but their exact role in bulk water transport has not been resolved. So once the solute has passed the capsparium strip, it can then enter the transport structures. As stated previously, there are two principal transport stru structures, the phloem and the xylem. Nutrients, minerals and water tend to travel in the xylem. The images on the slide shows two visual pictures of phloem and xylem. These have been selectively stained to so that show the different components and are labelled. You will note the bundle sheath, the primary phloem and the primary xylem, the secondary phloem, vascular cambium, secondary xylem and the pith. We will be dealing with the phloem in some detail in further lectures. This image shows the monseed vine vascular bundles. The large diameters are vessels within the xylem. Again you can see the xylem and the phloem structures, the pith and fibres and cortex. In the next few slides we will be dealing in some depth about the structural components of the xylem. In your DIY practical form and function you will be learning that monocots and dicots not only have different root compositions but they can also exhibit different xylem structures. This is a transverse section of a rush stem. Rushes live in wet areas and their stems grow to about two to four feet tall and they are able to support themselves very well. They are monocots and they do not form wood and all of their strength comes from three primary tissues. The bundle sheath, the connective tissue and the xylem tissue. This image is depicting a rush stem. Here we can note the epidermis, cortex, pith and cambium and where the phloem and xylem sit. You can see arrows indicating the direction of water and mineral movement in the xylem and the direction of sugar movement in the phloem. Let us explore the xylem structure in more detail. So the xylem structure as well as the phloem is part of the vascular tissue and to ensure no confusion it is also called conductive tissue so if you see this in your readings Please note it is the same thing. The xylem is made up of trachea elements and there are two types of these elements. There's the vessel elements and the triads. They are very specialised autonomy where their function is to conduct large waters of large quantities of water efficiently. I'd like you to think about this for a moment. If you were setting up a vineyard and you needed to supply your vines with water, what would you have to do to get your irrigation system working? 
Well, you'd have to put miles of piping down and connect that to a pump. You would then have to pump the water down the rows. There is much infrastructure required and much energy. What are the problems that you may entail? You may have leaks. These leaks will be more prone with changes of weather from cold, say, to very hot. You have moving parts of the pump and you have large amounts of power as there is much resistance. However, plants don't have any of this. You don't see a plant leaking. They don't have moving parts. And most importantly, their xylem is relatively simple, especially when compared to the root components, and it has low resistance. The vessel elements and triads have structural commonalities. The first, and perhaps most impressive, is that they function when they are dead. This is the only organ in the living system in the planet that does this. This means that the plant, as the plant grows, it lays down new xylem vessels. The nucleus then dies and the secondary walls become hard. And at this point, the, the vessel elements and triads become functional. They contain no membranes or organelles when they're functioning. They can be thought of as hollow, hollow tubes with lignified secondary walls that contain structures called pits. They have structural differences in their length and their width and the composition of the wall end structures. Pits are microscopic regions with no secondary wall and a thin primary wall and this allows the movement of water and solutes through them. Pits are located in pit pairs and these pairs are usually opposite one another. A pit pair generally results in a low pathway of resistance and this aids significantly to the functional capacity and abilities of the xylem. Pit membranes are porous layers between pit pairs. They have two primary walls and a middle lamella. Here is a concept drawing of a xylem structure. This is simplified so you can take home the main points. Firstly, the differences between the vessel membrane and the trachea. And secondly, how water might travel through the pits in each of these structures. The movement of the water is slightly different. There are a variety of variations of vessel elements and tree eggs in the plant kingdom. The figure on the slide shows some vessel elements and triads from the rush stem. You can see how they look quite structurally different. A third component of the transport vessels are fibres. These are structurally specialised support cells. They have thick walls and narrow lumen. Tracheids are shown on the image on the slide. They are elongated spindle shaped cells. They enable the movement of water under situations of low resistance. They can move water across large distances. They have pits which usually occur in pairs. The visual and structural representation and differences in the plant kingdom is quite stunning. On the slide in front of you is a stack of vessel elements from a vessel in wood, tilia wood. This is at a times 100 magnification and certain components have been stained so that you can differentiate. In the middle is a vessel. This slide shows the vessel elements in a corn stem. The vessel consists of several stacked vessel elements as you can see. To the right of the vessel elements are green staining phloem cells and red staining fibres, all of which form the vascular bundle. This is at times 100 magnification. Pits have different shapes. On this image we have both simple and scleriform pits in the vessel elements of Z plants. 
This is at a high magnification of times 400. Vessel elements can be described as short and wide with perforated end walls forming a proliferation plate at the end of the structure. Pits tend to be arranged in overlapping structures. The image below shows one pit and shows a one vessel element and a number of pits. Vessel elements are thought to be evolution advancements on tree eggs as they are only found in the geosperms and a subgroup within that. The tree ants, however, are found in both angiosperms and geosperms. Environmental components can impact on vessel element structures. For example, Goose and Days in 2014 conducted experimentation looking at the vessel element characteristics from 21 species of mangroves that went across 10 families of mangroves. The occurrence and the types of proliferated plates, the end wall slopes, vessel frequency, length to width ratio and specialised index with respect to end wall characteristics of stem vessel elements were investigated. Plants were collected from two different ecological habitats. There was a slope which had frequent tidal influence and a ridge which only had occasional tidal influence. The vessel elements of these plants growing on the slope have similar dimensions but were more or less similar length to width ratios. They had specialised incidies in comparison to those on the ridge region. The width of the vessel elements is significantly lower and the frequency of vessel elements per unit cross-sectional area is considerably higher in the slope plants than the ridge plants. The vessel element of the species of the species Rhizovia or R and Palmi, which are shown on the figure, have scoranliform perforated plates, while the others show simple plates. Xylem pressure gradients are important functional components of the xylem. In the xylem vessels, water moves freely in response to pressure or tension gradients that exist up and down the plant. The characteristics of the trachea that enable the response to pressure are that there are no cell membranes, while in the vessel elements the characteristics are proliferations in the cell wall. Both of these characteristics lead to superb efficiency in resistance. What this means in practical terms is that there is a great amount of pressure at the base of the xylem near the root structure compared to that at the top of the plant near the leaf structures. It is these differences that promote the movement of water. Now that we understand that water moves under large tension, what does this mean? Well, not only does it mean that water can move efficiently, efficiently within the plant, but there are problems associated with this large tension. The first is an inward force on the walls of the xylem. If you have problems conceptualising this, just think of a swimming pool and how thick the size of a swimming pool need to be in order to hold the water. A similar concept applies here to the xylem. The second significant problem with water when it is under pressure it is that it is physically unstable and when it is physically unstable the potential for bubbles to be produced in the water is great. So what is the problem if bubbles form in the xylem vessels? Well put simply they block the channel of water. In the image on the slide from Cornell University, you can see the concepts. The arrows demonstrate the movement of water through the vessels. A bubble or embolism has formed in the middle of the vessel element. Here the water needs to change direction. The, pit it, the pits are blocked because of the bubble. There are two forms of cavitation, a form that occurs and blocks 
the movement of water over a short period, hours to days, and then a more significant form of cavitation that causes long-term loss of water movement in the plant. With extreme water deficits, the incidence of cavitation can increase, in, significantly increase. In fact, this process can lead to plant death if it's on an extreme. Now that we have looked at the xylem vessel structures in some detail, you can relate this functional requirement to the entire plant, that is, how water moves from the roots through to the leaves. This diagram summarises many of the important components of this, particularly that of flow and how it's related to resistance and water potential. The water potential gradient plays a significant role in the movement of water through the plant, and we will examine this in some detail in the transpirational lecture at the end of this course. There are four articles of essential reading associated with this lecture and topic. The Tays and Zyger, Chapter 4, the section on water absorption by the root. Please read all the way through this section until you get to the <coughs> section on leaf and stomata diffusion to the atmosphere. Please insert your notes here. The second and third article are composed on the internet. One is on the transport in the xylem and the second is on the principles of adhesion and capillary action. Why does water adhere to the sides of xylem, tracheids and vessels? These articles are compiled by the University of Cornell, Cornell University. The third article is a nature article on the biomolecular engineering. It tells you all about how <clears throat> amazing plants are in their ability to move water up tiny trees. So to summarise and to conclude this lecture, you should have learnt about the detailed structure and the amazing function of the xylem vessels. You should now understand how water can move from the root system up to the leaf system. You should understand the inputs of pressure and resistance and how they can lead to the negative attribute of cavitation. You should be able to appreciate just how efficient this process is, especially when compared to man-made attempts to do similar feats. And also recognise that the xylem vessels are quite unique biological structures. And finally, the reason that we spend so long and spend so much time learning all of this in detail is it is critical for water use in agriculture and water management. That's the end of this lecture.